So I went ahead and documented. Um, I decided to study some of America's best women leaders, spent time doing diary studies of them, following them around, um, and came up with um, and put out there in the market a sort of definition of what women's best skills are, which included a focus on relationships, um, a bias for direct communication rather than communication up and down a chain of command, a preference for leading from the center rather than the top, bringing people in around them, uh, a, an ability, a capacity, as we were talking about yesterday, to integrate work and life instead of treating them as separate compartments, and a comfort with as opposed to tolerance of diversity. Women had been outsiders themselves and knew the kind of value an outside perspective could provide. So put these out there. And what has been extraordinary has been over the last 20 years to watch every one of these characteristics, think about it, become ever more appropriate to what organizations need as the technology and the demographics and the nature of the economy have changed. Putting yourself in the center, much more powerful when organizations are more web-like and efforts are more team-like. Comfort with diversity, obvious in a global economy. Relationships, key. I can't tell you, 20 years ago, going out and speaking in organizations, when you would talk about relationships, people would come up, that's a no. That's soft stuff. You don't, wanna, you don't want to um, connect women with relationships. It's going to make them look weak. Now every bank is telling you it wants to have a relationship with you. So these characteristics have become much more appropriate. And this, to me, was a cause uh, for enormous inspiration and excitement. But around about 2007, even I, with my obdurate optimism had to admit and had to face the fact that women were not making it to the very top levels at the, at the, in the numbers that we might expect. And therefore, women were not having as much strategic influence over the direction of the most important organizations and institutions that shaped our society as they could have. And Need I say that the financial crisis, which as Michael Lewis, its great chronicler, observed, the interesting thing, the significant thing about the financial crisis was how little role women played in it. That financial crisis kind of amped up my fascination with where are the women at the very top? Um, I wanted to know why, despite having these appropriate skills that I've laid out, despite good faith efforts in many organizations to promote women, despite the fact that women were increasingly being hired at parity, especially in partnership firms, and despite the fact that women uh, composed an increasing percentage of top business and professional school graduates, women were still not getting those top positions in anything like the numbers would suggest and therefore not having the influence. I began a series of dialogues with a brilliant executive coach in New York, Julie Johnson. We wanted to get to the back of the underlying reasons. We started doing some research. And then, and then, my attention was really struck and captivated by two big international studies that came out at the end of 2008 that began to suggest one of the reasons. That's not that there's only one reason, but a big and unexplored reason. Both of these international studies showed that senior, man, senior leaders in major organizations, although they put a high premium and appreciation on women's skills with relationship building, negotiation, communication, et cetera, teamwork, collaboration, tended to view women as being lacking in vision over and over. And by vision, I mean big picture, long-term, future focus. They saw women as lacking vision, and, that thi and this was a key impediment in terms of women not making it to the very top. That 
that, that lack of perceived vision. What was also fascinating about the research is that women did not see themselves this way. Women would often tend to underassess how they were viewed in terms of their communication, their other leadership attributes, but they had a strong sense of themselves as having a big picture focus. So I thought, something here is not translating. We need a language to describe if there are differences in women's vision. That is, how, what women see, what they notice, how they analyze what they notice, and how they connect the dots. We need a language that can help us recognize and articulate that so that women themselves can act more powerfully on it and so that organizations can benefit and leverage that capacity. So we began to do some real research. There were two significant, big, there, there are a lot of insights in the book, but two I want to share with you, and the first one I really want to emphasize, because I think, you know, having been in this for 25 years, I believe that this is going to become something that we're going to take for granted and is going to be part of the larger dialogue in a number of years. The first thing that we found was that it has to do with notice. That there are some, and we're talking about human beings here, so obviously we're talking about a curve. There are some significant and measurable differences in how men and women notice, in how, as Maggie would say, their attention is engaged. We saw this in the research, the interviews, the case studies we were doing, but also, like many of the presenters here, we were really influenced by the extraordinary neuroscientific research that's going on. Um, and at Yale, at Columbia, and at UCLA, there were significant studies that showed that when you do functional MRIs of people's brains in operation, women's notice, women's attention tends to encompass many things at one time, operating kind of like a radar, scanning the environment, where men's attention tends to focus on one thing at a time, and, and be the metaphor is more like a laser, focusing in on one thing. So that is a measurable and demonstrable difference that you can also hear when you interview people. But it's hard science that suggests that this is true. This is significant. I suggest this really matters because in many, if not most, organizations, focused notice is privileged and regarded as a leadership behavior, which makes sense given the fact that most organizations were developed on what you could call a male watch. And you hear it in the language, bottom line it, get to the point. You, it, it's, it's very apparent that focused notice is viewed as a leadership behavior and capacity. Um, and that this, to some extent, penalizes women. We